Hi everybody, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AnimeTutors.com and in this video we're going to be looking at infrared spectroscopy. Now, infrared spectroscopy is an analytical technique that, as the title suggests, uses infrared radiation uh, to help identify compounds. Uh, and infrared spectroscopy effectively works um, by firing infrared radiation at a sample or a set of molecules uh, and the bonds inside their molecules effectively absorb the uh, infrared radiation and the bonds start to vibrate and sometimes they can stretch uh, backwards and forwards, sometimes they can move up and down as well. Um, so they can stretch in different ways, stretch and bend in different ways. Now depending on uh, what's attached either side of that bond will depend on how quick that uh, bond will oscillate or vibrate. Uh, and from that we can obviously then hence work out um, bonds and types of atoms that are in our molecule and we can use this uh, to possibly help identify a molecule fully. So we're just going to look at um, an example of an infrared spectra because they look really messy, but actually they're not too bad to interpret. Uh, I'm going to show you how we can do that as well. And also I'm going to talk about, just very quickly, about the fingerprint region as well. Okay, so we're going to start with our infrared spectroscopy. Um, now the key thing is just not to look at every single peak in here. We're looking for key uh, features or key peaks that we uh, need to be able to uh, cross-reference against a set of known uh, wave numbers. Now we measure um, a frequency in something called wave number and actually I'll add this on the bottom here and you can see that uh, wave number is actually measured in centimetres to the minus one. So you might see that it's basically the same as frequency, how quick uh, the um, atom actually, the, the, sorry, the bond oscillates as well. So I've identified four key points here. Um, I've identified A first. So we're going to start with A. Now all you have to do is you look at the wave number where A occurs. Now A is occurring about 3,100, 3,200. It's quite well over to the left hand side. So we need to look at our um, table of known uh, wave number. And we can see that around about that frequency um, would be an OH. But you can see that also NH could fit in that bracket as well. So what we need to do is look at the actual shape of this. Now you can see that this shape is actually really broad. Now as soon as you see a broad peak, um, whoops. So as soon as you see a broad peak, at around about the 3,200 mark, um, you know that that's got to be an alcohol. If this was a sharper peak, it would probably more likely to be an NH. So we know because this is a broad peak and not a sharp pointy peak like this one, then this has got to be an OH. Um, and you can see here we've got the word alcohol underneath. So we can say that um, the A, this peak at A is because of an OH, more than likely to be caused by an alcohol uh, group rather than a carboxylic acid group, which is over here. So that's the slight difference there. Okay, if we look at B, we see we get a peak at B at about um, 2,900. Uh, so if we go around over here, so 2,900 would fit in here. So you can see that this molecule obviously has a CH group in here. That would be for most molecules. So uh, that would be found in something like organic compounds, for example. So CH, you'll probably see that quite a lot. It's only a little peak, so it's not very big. Okay, if we come on to the next one, we haven't, we've got some peaks here, but these are quite small and insignificant, so we can just ignore them. Uh, the next biggest peak here is peak C. Now, peak C, is, uh, you can see, is occurring about 1,700 mark, 1,600. So if we compare that in here, you can see that actually it fits in with this group here. So 1,600 is a C double bond O group. Now, this could mean a lot of things. This could mean uh, we could have a ketone on our hands, uh, we could have an aldehyde, um, we could have a, um, a carboxylic acid as well. So this could mean a lot of things. Let's write that down there. Uh, it doesn't really identify exactly what the molecule is, but um, we know that this molecule's got to have a carbonyl group in there somewhere. Okay, and the last one, which is D. Now D's got a peak, um, quite a, a, a wide peak as well, at about 1,300 or 1,400. Um, now, this 1,300 mark uh, would signify a CO bond. So this molecule also has um, this in there as well. Now, again, this could mean anything. This could be an ether. Uh, it could also 
um, signify an ester perhaps as well. Um, it doesn't really tell us a lot, but what it does tell us is that the molecule does have these bonds in here, and that's the good thing with infrared. But infrared obviously comes into its own um, really well, actually, um, with the something called the fingerprint region. And anything below 1,500, which is, I'll mark it in green, so anything kind of below there is generally quite messy, and we don't really need to interpret individual peaks here. We don't need to worry about that. Um, but this is really powerful, um, because actually the fingerprint region uh, can be compared to a known spectra, uh, and we can actually... Um, we can actually use that to identify exactly what the molecule is that we've injected in here. And the reason why we can do that is because the fingerprint region is unique to each individual molecule. So every molecule has a very unique individual fingerprint region. And so let's say if we take this here and we match it to a known library and there is a match between the two, then um, we can obviously identify what the molecule is. So even though it might be quite vague here and only tell us what type of bonds we have, um, it actually can be really powerful if we compare it against the known spectra. But like all types of spectroscopy and spectrometry, um, analytical techniques are not used, these things can't be used in isolation. Um, they're normally used and worked with other types of um, spectroscopy and spe spectrometry as well. So you might use uh, gas chromatography, you might use mass spectrometry, infrared spectroscopy, you might use uh, NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance, so you can use all of these three to help piece together a effectively what is like a jigsaw puzzle. You're finding little bits of information, uh, and these are used together, uh, and they're really powerful at identifying unknown substances as well. But that's it. Uh, hope that helps. Bye.